Well, if you can uh, make your way while I'm just taking a quick sip of water here to Ephesians. We are in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, obviously, this was a, uh, this is a busy time, it seems like, uh, for sport, uh, with uh, various factions forming in the church based upon uh, their uh, favorite team. Uh, and uh, this is a great opportunity for us to practice grace to one another. Uh, we had earlier, we had a, a nasty looking uh, <laughs> eagle's uh, scarf around the the, the pulpit, uh, but I uh, mean, uh, just just looking at teams and uh, what makes a, a good team uh, is probably a, a good team is is uh, is a team that is united in 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 their goal, what they want to achieve, uh, and also on how they play together. Do they care enough for other? I think some, some sports teams, you just, when you look at them, you just see that there, there is a, there is a unity there, uh, both in singular purpose, but also, uh, a, a, a wonderful team spirit makes up for a, for a good team and a team that will obviously go on and, and, and win. Uh, but here this morning in, in Ephesians, we have been looking at, uh, the church, asking uh, the question, who is the church? And we've covered the first three chapters, and and now we are in the applicational part of of this letter to the to the church in Ephesus. And Paul, the first thing he exhorts the Ephesian church to is to walk in in unity. Uh, so let me read for us just those first six verses. Um, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility, gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance to one another in love, and being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And there is one body and one Spirit, just also uh, you were all called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And we'll read up to there. Let me just pray for us before we continue. Father, we, we come to you, Lord, uh, amazed by your grace, Lord, with great thankfulness in our hearts. Lord, thank you for the ministry of your word. Lord, that your word is truth uh, and that you speak to us uh, through your word. And Lord, thank you for this passage before us. Lord, uh, an exhortation to unity, Lord, and also the elements um, on which our unity is based. And Father, as we look at this this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, warm our hearts, Lord, with the knowledge of the truth, with, with the knowledge of who you are and what your plan and what your purposes are for us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we have looked at uh, Paul's exhortation to the Ephesians church to unity. Uh, he says that we, that we should walk in a, in a manner that was worthy of our calling, meaning that what we know should be equal to what we practice. Uh, and then he calls out a number of, of attitudes or attributes or characteristics that we should grow in in order to maintain uh, or preserve, as he put it, uh, the unity of the Spirit. And that is humility, gentleness, uh, with patience, showing tolerance to one another or for one another in love. And now we're going to verses 4 to 6, and that will be the passage under our study this morning. We look at the, the elements of our unity. Uh, it says that there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. 
And Paul continues straight after his exhortation to unity uh, and mentioning these elements, these seven elements on which the church unity is based. And if you look, at, if you take a closer look at these seven elements, you'll see that uh, they can be further divided uh, into three groups based on the persons of the Trinity. We see talking about the Spirit in verse 4, we have the Lord in verse 5, and we have God the Father in verse 6. And so Paul was drawing on the Trinity uh, as the basis for church unity. And his point here is not so much mentioning the different persons of, of the God. It is not so much to, to show the differences, but to show that uh, there are three persons, but one God. And therefore our, our, our unity, he draws from the unity that exists within the Godhead. And Paul was actually using sound doctrine as the basis for practical application here. Uh, remember what we said, sound doctrine precedes or leads to sound practice. Sound uh, orthodoxy leads to sound orthopraxy. And all that we do as Christians must be based on sound teaching, sound doctrine. And that is what Paul uh, is doing here. And, and he uh, did not just grab the doctrine of the Trinity out of the blue to use in his exhortation to unity. Uh, there's been numerous references to the, to the three persons of the Godhead in the first three chapters. And so let's just quickly have a look at the, the Trinity uh, in Ephesians. Uh, but the before that, the Bible teaches that God exists in three persons and is yet one God. Uh, the word Trinity you will not find in the Bible. It's not used in the Bible. It's, the word simply means tri-unity or three-in-oneness. And the first time it was used by one of the church fathers, Tertullian, which is about 200 A.D., uh, but although you won't find the, the, the word Trinity in Scripture, the teaching of the three persons of, of the Godhead is throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament, it was partially revealed and progressively revealed, but it's more fully revealed in the New Testament. And here in the letter to the Ephesians, we, we find repeated references to all three persons of the Godhead. Uh, so let me have, just let, have a quick look at that. Chapter 1, if you can turn over there, we talked about God the Father is the one who elects and who predestines those whom he have called to, to be adopted. We see that the Son, that was verses 2 to 5, we see that the Son is the one who redeems uh, and in whom all things will one day be summed up. Verses 7 to 12, uh, we see God the Spirit is the one who seals the believer, the uh, one who have believed the gospel is both sealed by the Spirit of God and then the Spirit indwells them as a pledge for what is to come, a sort of a down payment, a guarantee of what is to come, verses 13 and 14. Chapter 2, we see again, we see that our reconciliation is to God and the reconciliation both to God, sorry, and our reconciliation is between uh, believers, between Jew and Gentile. Uh, verse 18 says, uh, through him, this is Jesus Christ, we have access in one spirit to the Father. Again, mentioning all three persons of the, of the Trinity. Verses 19 to 22, we read that the church uh, is uh, that as the temple of God, uh, built on the foundation of the truth, uh, and that truth is a revelation that was given to the apostles and the prophets with Christ as the cornerstone and is indwelled by God in the Spirit. Again, chapter 3, we read that uh, Paul was given the stewardship of God's grace, referring to God the Father. And this stewardship is a stewardship about the mystery of Christ, that we have God the Son, and it's revealed to the holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit, referring to God the Spirit. And then Paul ends is this section on doctrine with that prayer that we looked at in Ephesians 3 verses 14 to, to 21. And we see there in verse 14 that he prays, he says, I'm praying to God the Father, I'm bowing my knee to the Father. Uh, that's verse 14. And then 
he says that, that God would grant us to be strengthened, what, through His Spirit. Uh, verse, verse 16, uh, second, uh, the third person of the, of the Trinity. And why so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that we may be able to comprehend the love that Christ have for us, verses 17 to 19, to the effect that we would be filled up with all the fullness of God. And so though we do not have the word Trinity mentioned in, in the Bible or even in Ephesians here, the doctrine is everywhere. You just have to open your eyes. I, I was actually just amazed to, 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 to see again what the passage that, that Peter read for us this morning. Maybe you can do that in your own time, uh, chapter 20 of Acts. How often all three persons of the Trinity is mentioned, just verse 20 to 21, it says, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now behold, uh, bound by the Spirit, I am on the way to Jerusalem. And again, just all three persons of the Trinity is mentioned in, in uh, repeatedly throughout Scripture in numerous passages. And so my point is, is that this exhortation to unity that, that Peter based on, on the Trinity is not something he grabbed out of the air, but it's something that is already laid and mentioned and believed, uh, in the first three chapters of Ephesians. And so based on that, we, sh- we look at the Trinity. Uh, in our unity as a church. Uh, and we'll see, as I mentioned, there are three, uh, almost three hads mentioned, uh, descriptions, um, of, of our unity. The first one is, is that there is one body, one spirit, and basically one hope. Uh, and this is a triad based around the, the third person of the, of the Trinity, which is the spirit. And Paul starts with this because this was his main message. He's been telling us about the unification between Jew and Gentile into what? Into one new body, which is the church of Christ. Uh, Verses 23 of chapter 1 says that it is the, the body, the church is the body of Christ, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Um, And so Christ have only one body. Christ does not have numerous bodies. Uh, we read in chapter 2, verse 16, that Jew and Gentile were reconciled to one body, to God through the cross. Uh, chapter 2, verse 18, both Jew and Gentile now have access in one spirit to the Father. Chapter 3, verse 4 and to 7, Paul's stewardship of the, was the mystery of Christ, which was made known in the generations past, specific Uh, of which was that the Gentiles are now fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise of Christ through the gospel. And the point is that Paul is making is there is only one church, guys. There's not, there's only one body. There are not many bodies. There's not a, there's not a church for the Jews and the church for the Gentiles. It is one body and, and the one body consists of the church. Those who were chosen by God, those who were redeemed by the Son, and those who were sealed by the Spirit. As one commentator puts it, there can only be one authentic gathering of the body. And that is when it is brought together under the headship of Christ and infused by the presence of the Spirit. Anything else is a counterfeit. And so we see that This one body, this is of course referred to the universal church. The universal church, as we've said, is the church uh, that's made up of true Christian believers uh, everywhere since the time or since the day of Pentecost. uh, Throughout the the ages, uh, that makes up the universal church. But what is true of the universal church is manifestly true within the local church or should be manifestly true of the local church. That the local church should be a a manifestation of the one, the whole indivisible uh, universal church. But on the the surface level, when we look at the church, we see wow, there's there's a lot of division. There's a lot of, uh, yeah, this unity. Uh, in the church. And, and so what is, what is the cause of that? 
And I think one has to discern between the visible church and the invisible church. Uh, I mean, the body of Christ is not divided. The Lord knows those who are Him, 2 Timothy 2.19 tell us. And so the visible church would be those that we see, uh, that would, would come to church, that would attend church, and they would include both wheat and tares, Scripture tells us. The wheat would be the true genuine believer, and the tares would be the false believers. Uh, and then there is the invisible church, which is made up of those who are truly saved, truly believe, and are visible and known to the Lord Himself. He knows those who are His uh, and this invisible church become visible to us when we see the Spirit of God in people. Uh, the Spirit of God in dwelling people. Uh, they are the ones who belong to Christ. They are part of His one body. As, as Romans 8, 9 tells us, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Him. And so Paul is making the first point here is, is we are united, we are in unity because we are in Christ. We are in one body. We have been uh, basically drawn together and baptized into one body. And that brings us to the second point, the second element of our unity, and that is one spirit. This, of course, refers to the third person of the Trinity, uh, whom Jesus sent from his Father and who proceeds from the Father and is called the Spirit of Truth. We read that in John fifteen twenty six, And it is in one Spirit, this one Spirit, that we have unity. Remember just verse 3 in our chapter 4, it talks about the, 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 spirit, the, sorry, the unity that's in, this, in the Spirit or of the Spirit. Uh, but sadly... When we look at the church, uh, it seems to be that uh, this, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is very much misunderstood today and, and abused to some uh, degree and uh, is often the cause of disunity and division rather than unity. Uh, but I believe this division is the work of, of the devil himself who always comes to seek to just kill and to destroy, uh, who is a murderer and a liar from the beginning, John 8.44 tells us. But the ministry of the Spirit is, first of all, to convict the world of, uh, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, uh, John 16 tells us. The ministry of the Spirit is to give spiritual life to the believer, to quicken us, to make us alive. Romans 8, 11 says, If the Spirit of God, of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. And it's only when the Spirit of, of, of God works on our hearts and quicken us to believe, He gives us spiritual life. The ministry of, of the Spirit is also to baptize the believer into the body of Christ. We have one body and one spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 tells us, For by one spirit we are, were baptized into one body, whether we were Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Furthermore, the ministry of the Spirit is who is called, by the way, the Spirit of Truth, is to testify to the truth of Jesus. He reveals Christ. That is the main ministry of, of the, the Spirit, is to make Christ known. And He's the Spirit of Truth. He's not into fallible prophecies. The ministry of the Spirit is also to enlighten Ephesians 1.18 tells us, uh, to teach the believer, 1 John 2.27, to empower the believer, Ephesians 3.16, to guide the believer, John 16.13, to guide and to teach and to enlighten to the truth, of, or, of, of, for, about the truth, or in the truth, and for the truth. The ministry of the Spirit is also to give spiritual gifts. And he gives that to every believer as he sees fit, as he's, as according to his will. And that is for the edification of the church. It is for not personal or self-exaltation, but for the edification of the church, 1 Corinthians 12. 
The ministry of the Spirit is to sanctify the believer, to produce the fruit of the Spirit within us, Galatians 5.22. But as I said, sadly, sin and the the spiritual forces of darkness and wickedness, as they are mentioned in in uh, this first chapter of Ephesians, verse 21, and chapter 3, verse 10, and chapter 6, verse 12, they seek to deceive, they seek to destroy, they seek to divide the members of Christ's body. They seek to destroy the unity of the Spirit. And it's when we give in to our flesh that our works are marked by enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, and factions among other things, as mentioned to us in Galatians 5.20. Also, the wisdom of this world is earthly and, and natural and demonic, James tells us. And this gives rise to, to disorder and every evil thing uh, within the church. Further, we should realize that the spirit of the Antichrist is active in the church. And it's the root of every message and every prophecy which denies Jesus as God, Jesus as Lord. Uh, we, are, we are called not to believe every spirit, but to test the spirit, to see whether they are from God, because there are many false prophets who have gone out into the world. And as I said again, the spirit of God is the spirit of truth. And God's word is said to be true. And so we have church unity because we share, we are baptized into one body by one spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is also the guarantee of the hope that we have, the sort of the down payment of what is to come. And that leads us to the third one. We have one hope, uh, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. Uh, Every believer is born to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as 1 Peter 1, 3 tells us. And that hope is firmly linked to our calling. And our calling originates in God the Father, who chose us before the foundation of the world in Christ. We read in chapter 1, verse 4 of Ephesians. And those whom He foreknew... He predestined, and those he predestined, he called, and those he called, he justified, and those he justified, he glorified. And what can we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's, of course, Romans 8, verse 29 to 31. So our hope is sure. Our hope is steadfast. Uh, And no one is able to snatch us from his hand. We are in Christ. We are in his body. We have his spirit. And we have hope. Uh, And that hope comes to us, first of all, through the external call of the gospel. That is how we enter into the hope. And that's why the gospel is central to the unity of, of the church. Romans 10, 12 to 15 tells us, Whoever will call on the name of the Lord, will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. And so the gospel is that external call, the call to hope, the call to uh, reconciliation to God. And we are united because we have all responded to the external call. But it's God's Spirit who makes that external call an internal call, an effective call that will save us and cause us to repent and turn away from our sins and, and follow Christ. And I pray that we would be a church with beautiful feet. That we would be a church that go and and take the gospel 
proclaiming the message of hope to a world that is confused, that is perplexed, that is suffering and hurting, and they look for solutions in all the wrong places. Uh, they look for it in education, in legislation. But what they need is a transformation of their heart. And you and I have hope. We have the message of hope. We are the bearers of God's hope to a dead and dying world. To a world that is separated from Christ. Uh, it says earlier in chapter 2 of 12, verse 12 in Ephesians that um, they have no hope and they are without God in this world. And so I pray that, that you and I would be people with beautiful feet, people who take the gospel and proclaim the hope that we have in Christ. Uh, and maybe, maybe we need to be reminded of the hope that we have, uh, the marvelous hope that, that once stirred up your heart uh, for the Lord. Uh, we are, our hope is, is, is to live forever, really. Is our hope is uh, we have a hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. Titus one verse two. It is the hope to be like Christ, uh, the hope of glory, which is Christ in you. Colossians one twenty seven, uh, and that ver Colossians three four tells us that when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. And that is the hope that we have, that there is more than just this life, that we will be glorified. Those whom God have called, He justified, and those He justified, He will glorify. And so we have the hope of eternal life, we have the hope of glory, and we have the hope of reward. Not only has God graciously saved us, He involves us in His plans and purposes. We become the means through which he shares and, 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 and uh, disseminate the hope of the gospel. Um, verse 10 of chapter 1 of Ephesians, he said, He made known to us uh, of his will according to his kind, or the mystery of his will according to the kind intention which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. And so you have the hope of reigning one day with Christ when all things are summed up in Him. Uh, we as believers would reign with Christ. Uh, that's part of the message of the parable Jesus told in Luke 19. And actually it's, it's stated explicitly uh, in 2 Timothy 2.12. That if we are faithfully enduring with Him, we will also reign with Him. Uh, and the church should be a foretaste of that. It's, it's a bit of a preview. Um, the glorious summation of all things in Christ. That should be seen in, in the church. Uh, and what we do now in this world for Christ and for His kingdom basically echoes on into all eternity. Uh, and so we have one body, one spirit, uh, and actually the spirit is that a pledge, uh, a guarantee that, that God has given us, uh, ensuring us that the hope that we have is a real hope. It's not just wishful thinking. Uh, it will happen, and God has actually given us His spirit to show that it will happen as a pledge. And so that's the first triad on which Paul based the unity within the church surrounding the person of uh, the Spirit, uh, the third person of the, of the Godhead. Then he continues verse 5, One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And so what unites us, what binds us together in unity is the fact that we have one Lord. And that one Lord is Jesus Christ. 
And the reason I'm saying that the Lord here refers specifically to Jesus Christ is because throughout the letter of the Ephesians, whenever the word Lord is used, it's used in connection with Jesus, with Jesus Christ. And so the church is in unity because we have a mutual confession. Jesus is Lord. That is our confession. And he's Lord over everything. Okay, he, he, uh, he has won the victory. And though we don't see him at this time reign, that will happen at his consummation when, when all things are summed up in him. But that's not the point that, or that, that, that Paul is trying to make you here. He's, he's saying he's won Lord by means of the fact that he has purchased you with his blood. You belong now to him. He has redeemed us, it says in verse 7 of chapter 1. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And redemption basically is is an economical term, means to purchase, to buy. He bought us. And that is further uh, affirmed in in 1 Corinthians 6.20 when it says, For you have been bought with a price, and the price was Christ's life. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies. Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 7.23, you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. And so we are in unity because we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead and therefore we are saved, Romans 10.9 tells us. And there is only one Lord. And every other religion, every other belief, every other other creed or confession which does not acknowledge or accept Jesus as Lord is of the spirit of the Antichrist. It is a distortion. It is a deception. It's a demonic lie. 1 John 4, 3 tells us that every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. And therefore there can be no unity with those who serve another Lord, who have another master. And so what binds the church together in unity is the mutual belief that there is no other name given under or under heaven that's been given among men through which we must be saved. He alone is Savior. He alone is Lord. And if anyone preaches to you another gospel, another good news, uh, other than or contrary to the good news of Jesus Christ, he is to be accursed. And that's not me saying it. That is God saying that. Galatians 1.16 says, I am amazed that you so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, and I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. And whenever God repeats something in his word, take note. He emphasizes that. And so the church, we are united. We are in unity. Why? Because we have one Lord. We have one Messiah. We have one Christ. We have one mediator. We have one Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord. And we bow down to Him and we accept Him as Lord and we embrace Him as our Savior because we have one faith. That's the the next element of unity that Paul mentions. We have one Lord, one con- one faith. And there's been disagreement among theologians as to whether this refers to objective faith, meaning the body of truth that needs to be believed in order to be a Christian, or subjective faith, meaning the, the trust that you express uh, in, the, in, in the Lord. 
And I believe this actually refers to a body of doctrine that constitutes the Christian faith. Uh, we are united not because we believe, not because we have faith. And let me make sure you understand what I'm meaning by that. Is It's, it's not faith in itself. Uh, faith is only as good as the object in which you place it. Okay, so it's not because we are, we have the ability or we, we trust, uh, but it's what we trust or who we trust. That is what is important. So here, what binds us together is the fact that we have faith in Christ. We have faith in the gospel. We have faith in the word of God. Uh, and so you may say, well, wh- why are there so many different Christian denominations and groups? Well, I think there are probably a, a number of answers. Uh, but there are a few factors that I can mention that will contribute to the fragmentation of the one faith that we have. And that may be a lack of faithful and diligent Bible study. Um, We live in a time of unprecedented access to the Bible, but also a time of unprecedented ignorance of what it actually says. There are many false teachers and false prophets that arise and base their ministries on what people want and not what they need to know. Uh, There are still some bastions of traditions of men and human philosophy which have not been scrutinized biblically. Uh, There are influences of the world and of the flesh, uh, a denial of the six-day Uh, Literal creation is an example of that, or the biblical support that is found for a homosexual lifestyle. That is influences from the world and from the flesh. Uh, And so when when within the church those arise who profess these things, that is where we find uh, disunity. But the body, the the truth of of God is, is one truth. And what we believe when we believe this to be the word of God, then this is the one faith that we hold to. Um, And so, I mean, there are doctrines on which we stand and we will die on. uh, Foundational doctrines, foundational to our faith. That is that this is the inspired, inerrant word of God. If you do not believe this, then that you're probably not a Christian. Uh, If you believe in the Trinity, as expressed in the Word of God, uh, you have to believe that to be call yourself a Christian. You have to stand on the person and work of Christ, the Gospel. You have to believe that. Um, but there are some other doctrines as well that's probably more peripheral, uh, where there is room for different understanding and different interpretations, and you can still claim to be a Christian, you still be a Christian, and probably one area is, is eschatology on, on what's going to happen in the end. Uh, there are different views on that, and regardless of what view you have, whether you are pre-mill, post-mill, or amill in your position, you know what, you can have that position and still be a Christian, uh, provided you hold to uh, the faith, the one faith, the faith that has been handed down uh, to the saints. That's what Jude was saying. Jude in, in, in Jude 3 says, Beloved, I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation. I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. And so this is the body of doctrine, the truth that was handed down by the saints. This is the body of truth, the doctrine that, that uh, we have on which is the foundation which the, the apostles and the prophets lay down for us with Christ being the cornerstone here in Ephesians 2.20. Uh, and it is the faithful doctrine that has been defined and delineated and disseminated and defended and depended on throughout the ages by faithful men and women of the church. And it is faith in that body of truth, that is what binds us together. Um, And we'll look more um, in the weeks to come, in verses 7 to to 16, uh, of God enabling us to, to grow and to attain to a unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. 
And so in the second triad based around the Lord, we have one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Again, here there's some disagreement on, on whether this refers to spiritual baptism or water baptism. Uh, I believe and understand it to be a reference to water baptism because the spiritual baptism was implied in reference to the Spirit. Uh, the Spirit is the one who baptized the believer into um, the body. And here we have the next tree heart of elements based around the second person of the Trinity, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. And, and, and water baptism has been a confession of faith, the one faith, confession of the gospel. Uh, and actually water baptism is a beautiful picture of our union in Christ. Uh, we read of that in, in Romans 6, when we read that uh, as Christ died and was buried, we who believe in him were died and were buried. And then as he was raised up to life again, we who believe in him, who are in him, were raised up to life again. And, and, and water baptism by immersion is a beautiful picture of that truth, of that reality. And so this one baptism speaks of you raising up your hand and say, I believe, I believe in the one Lord, I believe the one faith, the truth about this, the truth of what Scripture reveals about Christ, the gospel. And therefore, that public confession, you act out in water baptism. And there's one baptism uh, which symbolizes our union with Christ. Um, so we have unity in the Spirit which is one body, one spirit, one hope. We have unity in the Son, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And now we have unity in the Father. We have one God and Father. Let me just read that for us. One, um, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And so the Paul based his exhortation to unity on these elements. And these elements, as I said, is divided into uh, the three persons of the Trinity. And now Paul lastly turns to God the Father, and he describes him as one God and Father of all. And again, the, all, the question is, to whom does the, the all refer uh, I believe it refers to all believers and not all people. Uh, because firstly, in, in Ephesus, or in this letter of, to Ephesus, uh, the Father is described as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And since we are in Christ, since we are in union with Him, we have Him as our Father because He is uh, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, that He is our Father in Christ because of our adoption. Christ adopts, or the Father adopts us as His children in Christ. And lastly, then, just in the in the context, the immediate context, where Paul speaks of unity in the church, and so this unity that is based on on the unity in the Trinity, uh, and it's the fact that we share a faith in Christ uh, that. God becomes our Father. So the Father of all here refers as the uh, uh, to those who have God as their Father, uh, not not uh, in the sense where sometimes God is referred to as the Father of of all things of creation, and He is, but in the sense that He brought it forth. Here it's it's redemptive in nature, uh, and so we have unity because we have one God and He is Father of all. Uh, and in stating it that way, Paul makes the point that Christianity is monotheistic. We believe in one God. We don't believe in three gods. We believe, believe in one God. And there is unity in the work of the, and the role of the Spirit, uh, the work of the Son, and the work of the Father, but He is one God. And that is what uh, Old Testament obviously refer, the, our Jewish foundations to the Christian faith, states in the Shema, recorded for us in Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, 
the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And Jesus actually quoted that when they asked him, what is the greatest commandment? Uh, he started off by saying, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And so Paul drew attention to this truth by saying that we are in unity because we worship one God. And He is the Father of all. He is the Father of the Jewish believer. He is the Father of the Gentile believer. He is the Father of male believers, of female believers, of slaves, of freemen. He is the Father of all those who confess Jesus Christ as Lord through faith and have been sealed by His Spirit. If you can claim that, then you are a child of God and then you are part of His body. And it says that he is one God and Father who is over all. That means he is supreme. He rules. He reigns. He exercises control over all his children. And just as on the practical side, that should give us, give us incredible peace of mind, incredible security, incredible comfort to know that it doesn't matter what is going on in your life, God reigns. It hasn't caught him by surprise. This is not, oh dear, what are we going to do now? Look what France has done this time. He knows, he reigns. And our heavenly, loving, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present Father is in control of all things. Uh, and He says He will never leave you nor forsake you. And He will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to bear. But with the temptation, give you also the way of escape. Uh, your heavenly Father loves you. And he is sovereign because he is over all. And so he's not over, over all, but he's also through all, which means he works through all. God blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Uh, he created us for good works in Christ Jesus, which, we, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in. Uh, and he is the one who works in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure, Philippians 2.13 tells us. And so we are in unity because God is at work in us and through us. Uh, we have the same goal. We have the same. We, we, we want his plans and his purposes to, uh, to come to fruition. That's why we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Uh, and he works through us graciously to bring those uh, plans and purposes about. We are instruments in His hands to accomplish His redemptive plans. And as we read in, in, in verse 20 of chapter 3, that He is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we may ask or think according to the power at work within us. And so He is the Father of all who is over all, who works through all, and he's in all. Um, he indwells every believer, every son and daughter through his spirit. He is in us all. And that's why Christian fellowship is so amazing. When, when you have true Christian fellowship, there is where true joy is found because the Spirit of God that is in each and every believer comes together and we have fellowship with God and Christ through the Spirit and one another. And as we, as His presence abides in us, that's when we are being transformed. And that's why we start to love as He loved. And that's why we have joy. And that's why we have peace with Him and with others. We become peacemakers. That's why we do good. That's why we are kind. That's why we are faithful and gentle and, and why we exercise self-control. Why? To please Him. And the point that Paul is making through all of this is, is just as the Trinity cannot be divided, therefore the church should not be divided. We have unity in because our unity is based upon the persons of Christ. One body, one spirit, one hope.
to which you have been called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all, and through all, and in all. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, your truth. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you speak clearly and accurately. And Lord, help us to understand, help us to believe. Lord, I thank you that you have worked the unity within the church through the roles uh, within the Godhead. That, Father, you are our Heavenly Father the Father of all, Lord, all those who believe and that you are over all and, and through all and in all. And Father, our unity is based on the ministry of the Son, that he is the one who redeemed us, who bought us at a price, Lord. that he is Lord, Lord, and that we believe that. We believe the truth about Jesus Christ, um, and we confess that when we, when you first quicken our hearts to salvation, Lord, and we stand up and profess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and we submit ourselves to that one baptism. Lord, and we know that you're, we are one because your spirit works in us. Um, who both baptize us into one body, but also, Lord, is the, is the down payment, the guarantee, the pledge of the hope that we have, the hope of being with you for all eternity, the hope of being changed, Lord, when, when finally uh, the presence of sin would be removed uh, and we would be glorified uh, as Christ is glorified now. So, Lord, I do pray for the unity within our church. Lord, help us that we would uh, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit uh, by being humble and gentle and patient and tolerant to one another in love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>